morning, everybody. Uh, I'm not with you today, even though I'm with you by way of video, but I'm really excited about what today holds. Um, Jay Perillo is a young man who's been on our staff team for a number of years now at the chapel, working in our vintage young adults ministry as the discipleship coordinator. And he's spoken there on a number of occasions and, uh, and has been involved in ministry for some time, as well as pursuing uh, some of his academic credentials in that regard as well. And I'm really encouraged that uh, he's gonna be speaking to us today. And as you know, here at the chapel, we create a culture that helps to develop leaders, particularly young leaders. And you've gotten to hear from some of them. You got to hear from John Drake recently, and he's one of our young leaders. And Jay Perillo's another one. And so I'm uh, trusting that you're going to be really encouraging to him, that you're gonna listen uh, to what the Spirit of God wants to say through him. Uh, I already know a uh, direction that he's going in his message, and I'm really encouraged for our church to be able to hear that. So join with me when he makes his way up on the platform uh, of really welcoming and being really encouraging to uh, our special guest today, Jay Perillo. Good morning. Uh... As uh, Pastor Jerry said, my name is Jay, and I work with Vintage, the college-age young adult ministry. Uh, I work right under Pastor Wes, um, and I started off as an intern there, and uh, now I'm, I'm full-time uh, heading up uh, the discipleship there. And I just want to say, uh, kind of as, as a small guy on staff, you know, young guy working my way up, uh, the leadership here at this church, um, and they're just, they're so easy to follow. You know, I know sometimes as an outsider and a tender, um, maybe you don't, you don't see the, the behind the scenes. Uh, but now that I've seen that, I can just tell you that, man, this church is, is just filled with, with men of God. And, and they've really poured into me and my life, and, and it means a great deal. Um, but I just want to say that whether this is your first time here or you come here on a regular basis, whether you're in this room or you're somewhere else, maybe next door, over at a Lockport camp uh, location, over at our Lockport campus, man, it's an absolute joy and honor as a staff member to be able to worship with you. And worshiping through song uh, or pressing our lives against the scriptures to see what they have to say to us, even worshiping through conversations. Uh, we just consider it an honor, a joy, and we are humbled that you would join us this morning. But before we get started, would you uh, be so kind as to posture yourself in prayer and uh, pray with me. Lord God, I just thank you for this morning and a place we have to, to gather and worship together. And God, I understand just with the sheer number of people that are under my voice, even right now, that there are people here from a variety of experiences. For some, God, life is tough right now, perhaps due to some circumstances. Maybe it was even tough to get out of bed this morning, to put one foot in front of the other, but they're here or they're watching. God, for others, maybe life is great. They've seen some of their best days. God, maybe there's even some people who, and they don't even know if you're real yet. They don't even know if they can trust you and who you say you are. God, I just ask that you do what only you can do. Meet all of us this morning where we're at. Spirit, paint a picture of who Jesus is, and may that not only inspire or motivate us, may it change us. God, may the meditations of my heart, the words of my lips honor you. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, tomorrow's Labor Day, and while um, I'm assuming that's good news for some, because it's a day off, uh, you don't have to, you know, battle the Mondays tomorrow, I'm sure it's bittersweet for a bunch of us, because it kind of marks the end of the summer. For students, it certainly is. Summer vacation's over. But Labor Day, it has its roots uh, in the, the late 19th century, and it was a response to all of the harsh working conditions that Americans had to endure in the 1800s. When your typical American, just for a simple meager wage, would be working 12-hour shifts seven days a week, where in some states, children as young as five entered the workforce. 
And so Labor Day was a response to the tough working conditions that Americans had to endure. And then it kind of transformed into celebrating Americans and all the hard work um, that they have done in their lives to build this country, uh, to build a life. And so tomorrow, for not everyone, but for many people, you have a day off because of all uh, the work that you've committed to do in your life. What if I propose something to you this morning? What if I propose to you the truth or the reality that God has a work that he wants to do in your life? That God isn't off in the distance doing God-sized things. He isn't off in the distance too busy with other civilizations or creating things that we wouldn't understand or comprehend. That he's not too busy doing the big stuff, but instead, he's so invested in your life that he wants to do a personal, specific work in you. The scriptures are laced with examples of God seeking to work in the lives of individuals. And I just want to look at one small, specific way in which the scriptures describe what God wants to do in your life and in my life. And that simple verse is found in the book of Philippians. Now to give us a little context this morning, the book of Philippians was written by this guy named Paul. You learned about him, actually, if you were here last week or if you watched last week, uh, as Pastor Jerry described his life. Paul, the artist formerly known as Saul, had an experience on a road. Had an experience with Jesus Christ, so much to the point where it not only changed his name to Paul, but man, it changed his life path. And so what he decided to do was start traveling from city to city to tell people and persuade them of God's grace, of who God is and what he's done for humanity. Well, the letter of Philippians is to the church at Philippi. And so Paul, he's not with them now. He's actually in Rome, in prison. He's writing a letter as kind of a spiritual father. And after a brief introduction, after briefly telling him, telling them that they're in his prayers, he says this, verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul says this, I'm confident in this fact that he who began a good work, and who began the good work? God did. That God who began a good work in these people's lives, that he's going to see it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul was there. He saw the work God had done in people's lives. He saw the miracle that God does when he enters someone's life. And Paul was there, and he's saying, I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, he's going to complete it. It's important for us to note this morning the simple yet profound fact that God does the work. Because religion teaches something different. Religion teaches that you and I, that we need to do work in order to earn the favor of God. That you and I, we have to either adhere to or follow or live to these these specific principles, morals, and values. And if we do that, or if we do that enough or in the right way, that we would earn the favor of God or the gods or whatever it may be. Or if you and I, if we were to participate in rituals or ceremonies, that in some way we would win God's favor. We see that in the early portion of of human existence, when early people groups would try to do things in order to get the God's favor, in order to get sunshine, or in order to get rain for their crops, or in order to get well or be healthy. They would do things in order to somehow please or appease or get in favor of God. But the Christian faith doesn't teach that. 
No, the Christian faith teaches that, that God does the work. Paul writes this to a young man he's mentoring. In 1 Timothy, he says this. He says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. You see, at the very perfect time, Christ stepped into human history, and he lived the life that you and I should have lived, but we couldn't. He lived a life free from the stain of sin, the sin that stains your life and my life, the sin that is seen easily in our thoughts, our words, in our actions, the sin that resides in our souls, the sins that would bring some of us or even all of us embarrassment if people were to see what we think, our selfishness, our deceit, our bitterness, our anger. Jesus stepped in, lived a life free from that so he could do some work, so he could do some dirty work, work on a cross, being tortured, humiliated, and suffering for your sin and for my sin. You see, the Christian faith teaches that God did the work. It's not about which pathway leads up the mountain to God and if all paths lead towards God. No, 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 no. Jesus came down off the mountain, put you and I on his back, and carried us up. Christ did the work. I remember the first time I heard that message in a way that it really meant something to me. I had heard it as a kid at a youth camp. I had seen it through the prayers of my grandparents, but it didn't mean enough to me. And then as a teenager, in a service very similar to this, man, Christ became very real, and the work he did became very real to me. And I was in a tough spot. See, even though I hadn't lived for a very long time, I'd already faced some circumstances and also made some poor decisions that I was in a dark, dark place. I had some substance addictions to a variety of things. I was looking for purpose in life because it was tough to see any. The pain I felt on the inside, I was looking to numb in any way possible. And Jesus met me. And while I didn't understand everything, I just knew he was real. And I knew the work he had done for me. And while I, I thought to myself, there's no way I could be that church person, there's no way I could be good enough, it was undeniable who Christ was and his reality. So I stepped into a relationship with him. I said yes to God's grace. And when someone says yes to God's grace, man, he enters into their life. The prophet Ezekiel says this in the Old Testament, an example of the triune God and what he does. Ezekiel, this is God speaking. Ezekiel shares with us, he says this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. That when you and I, when someone says yes to God's grace, when someone says yes to the salvation that Jesus offers, that God by his spirit moves into that person's life and he begins to change them. And he starts a work in their lives. And what Paul's saying is that he who began a good work is going to complete it. And God began a good work in my life when I was a teenager. Began a good work. And while I am not the man I want to be quite yet, I am not the person I was. I am no longer dominated by some of the things that were in my life. 
that Jesus set me free. And Jesus says to me this morning, to Jay, he says, I began a good work in your life and I'm gonna complete it. And he says the same thing to you, to those who are under my voice, who God began a good work in your life, then he is going to complete it. Now, again, it's important to note who the writer of this letter is because Paul is doing something. He's doing something special with the language he's using. Remember, as Pastor Jerry said last week, man, Saul was a smart guy. Very smart, excelled in school. Let's just face it. He's the kid who sat, sat in front of the room, raised his hand, and had to answer for every single question. You know the kid that just kind of annoyed you a little bit? You know, you'd be, you and I, we'd be studying our brains out for the big test, and, you know, we were hoping for a 90, and we'd probably settle for an 80. Paul comes skipping by. Hey, look, I got 107. <laughs> hey, look, I got 107. That's what you'd say to your friends after you skipped along, because that's what kids with all the blue stars do. They just skip everywhere. But Saul was a very smart dude to the point where he had the first five books of the Bible memorized. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Committed to memory. It's likely that he had the Psalms and even portions of the prophets committed to memory, knowing them. I mean, he knew the law inside and out. He was a religious teacher, a teacher of the law in his culture, in his context. As Pastor Jerry said last week, I mean, he studied under a very popular rabbi. I mean, he basically, he had like Ivy School education. So when he uses the language, he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion. Paul's doing something. He's doing something here that all good literature does. It's got a deeper meaning. Paul's kind of nodding, he's kind of winking to his Jewish reader. Well, where did God begin a good work and complete it? Well, that's at the beginning. That's back at Genesis. Let me read a few portions of the creation account. It's not on the screen, I'm just gonna skip through it, but let me read a few portions of it for this morning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. God saw that light was good. Skipping down. God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let this dry ground appear. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it. God saw that it was good. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate day from the night. And God saw that it was good. Are you tracking with me? God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals. God saw it was good. God saw all that he made, and it was very good. Thus, the heavens and the earth were completed. Just as God started to speak everything into existence, the cosmos, the planets, the galaxies, as that rolled off his tongue, as that came off his breath, just as this planet was dark and void, and God spoke life onto this planet, he does the same exact thing in someone's life. And the same source, the same power, that created everything, that invented the trees outside, that same power is at work in your life and in my life. Paul uses this again to another group of people in another city, the city of Corinth. 
In 2 Corinthians 4, 6, this is what he says. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, the creation, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. That same power that created the nuclear energy for the billions of stars that created the sun that helped sustain life on this planet. That same power is at work in your life and in my life. And just like at day seven, God sat back, looked at everything, and said, this is good. To those who say yes to God's grace, he wants to stand there at the end of your life, at the day of Christ, and look at your life and say, that was good. That was good. Perhaps that might bring some hope and encouragement to some of us this morning, to some of us who maybe feel like, man, our spiritual walks or, or our, our faith Maybe our growth, it's kind of the wheels have been spinning, kind of stuck. We haven't been growing quite, quite like we thought we would. Or, or maybe we're still maybe stuck in something. Maybe something still seems to have a little bit more power over us than we want it to. And we haven't fully experienced Christ's freedom yet. Paul's saying, I'm confident of this, that God who began a good work in you Man, he's going to complete it. He's going to finish it. That while at times people, that, that God's people, that, that were hypocrites in transition, that God is going to complete his work. God is not like man. He doesn't struggle to finish cleaning his garage. He doesn't struggle to finish the house projects. He doesn't start something and not see it complete. No, What God starts, he finishes. And the author and finisher of your faith and mine, he is going to bring it to completion. That is hope for us this morning. But when I talk about the work that God does in our lives, what do I mean by that? I mean, what does that look like? What is the nature of this work? Well, I think it's seen just a few verses down when Paul is writing to these, uh, to these Philippians and he's talking about what his prayer for is for them. He says this in verse 9, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He says, and this is my prayer. This is the work that I want to see God do in your life. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. That you and I, as we learn more about God, as we see and experience him more and know who he is and what he's all about, that our affections would grow for him, that our passion to love him, to know him would grow, that we would grow in our love towards our creator that we would grow in our love towards those who he created, that we would love people as God loves them. That you and I would be able to discern what is best and maybe pure and blameless. That simply means that you and I would be able to make right decisions. That in life there's two decisions. The way of God and not the way of God. The narrow path and the wide road. That you and I, we'd be able to discern what's God's way and what's not. And that we would make decisions 
that would honor God, that we would make decisions that would please him, that we would make decisions that would save us from hurt and pain, and that we would be filled with the fruit of righteousness. That's the evidence of the decisions we make. That as we discern and we make the correct decisions in our life, when we choose God's way, we'd have fruit from it. Fruit of the righteousness that comes from Jesus working in our lives. Fruit like love, patience, gentleness, compassion, self-control. Fruit marked by living a life wrapped around Christ and what he has for us. See, God wants to work in your life. And this isn't about behavior modification. This isn't about him, Jesus coming, dying on a cross, looking to make bad people good or make good people better. No, it's about Jesus entering a life and God entering your life and beginning to change you. And as he changed you, the fruit is displayed for not only God, but for the people in our lives as they see God moving and working in and through us. That's the work that God wants to do in our lives. But sometimes we get this messed up because this, this goes right against the notion that God comes into your life to give you what you want. That when you say yes to God's grace, when you receive that and the work that Jesus has done on the, has done on the cross, that sometimes you and I think that means, oh, then God's going to give us everything we want. But the reality is that if you and I, if we got everything we wanted, we probably wouldn't look much like Christ. That you and I, if we got every single thing we wanted, probably wouldn't look selfless in giving, but instead would be even more self-absorbed and greedy. This stares right in the face against God as a genie. Against rubbing a lamp and God granting you your three wishes. No, because if the work in our lives is to make you and I look more like Christ, that means sometimes it can be painful. Sometimes you and I, we give up too easy on the work God wants to do in our lives because it's painful. But God says, while it's painful, it's a good work. If you glanced at me and I had a saw in my hand and was looking to cut off someone's limb, you'd probably have some conclusions about me. I pray you would have some conclusions about me. But... If you got the backstory, if you saw the big picture, that I was removing someone's limb that had gangrene, and if I didn't, it would kill them, you'd look at me in a completely different way. Sometimes we can't see the backstory. Sometimes we can't see the big picture. But God's removing things in our life for our good. And while it may hurt, You and I need to trust that God is at work and that it is good. And just like the Grand Canyon, just like the falls, just like a beautiful starry night, just like that's good, the work that God is doing in our lives, it's good. It's so good. But what's the purpose of the work. I mean, God is at work in our lives. What's the purpose of it? Why? Paul says this in the very next verse, verse 12. 
He says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. That's the big picture right there. Advance the gospel. He's writing from prison. And he's saying, listen, what has happened to me, it's for good because it's advanced the gospel. Paul's in prison. And while he might not know it now, and he's on death row. I mean, he is going to be executed for his faith in Christ. He is going to be executed by the empire that has him in, that has him in prison for his faith. But he says, this is the big picture. This is why God's at work in my life. This is why God's at work in your life. Man, because God loves humanity. And that the sin that separates humanity from God... While that separates people from him, God is pursuing people. And he's going to do that through the people who have said yes to God's grace. That's why Jesus says in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. This is Jesus. He's talking to 11 men who just had a three-year adventure with him. And he doesn't say, hey, I'm leaving now. Reminisce, talk about, have a good time thinking back of this incredible adventure you had, all these life-altering events that happened. He didn't say, just get together once a year, kick back, and talk about the good times. Talk about the miracles you've seen. He said, no, go. Go and tell other people. Go and tell all creation what you've seen, what you've experienced, the experience that you've had with Jesus. And he's not only saying that to them this morning, he's saying that to you and he's saying that to me. To go and tell people about what Jesus has done in your life, what Jesus means to you, how he's changed you, how he's revealed himself to you, how his reality is unmistakable. Go and share that. Because that's the purpose of the work. And God is going to reach people through flesh and bone. That whatever God is going to do in this area, he's going to do through his people. That whatever God's going to do in your life, whether that be your neighborhood, your workplace, your family, whatever God is going to do In those areas, he's going to do through you. You and I have to recognize the big picture. And until you and I get that straight, that we're not just students, that we're not just lawyers or doctors or business people, we're not just that and happen to be a follower of Christ. But instead, we're followers of Christ who happen to practice medicine. We're followers of Christ who happen to be in the business world. And if we get those priorities out of order, then we're going to miss the work that God wants to do through us. We're going to miss it. But here's the reality for us this morning. The reality is simple. Jesus did the work for you so he can do a good work in you. Jesus did the work, went to the cross. You and I were spiritually bankrupt. We couldn't pay that. But he didn't just do the work on the cross and that's it. That's the end of the story. No, 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 no. There's more days to come. And in those days, he wants to do a good work in you. Jesus did the work for you so he can do a good work in you. And this isn't God cleans you up so then he can send you out. This is a both and, that he's cleaning you up while he sends you out. There was a woman at the well, and 
She had a lot of baggage, had a number of marriages, and Jesus changed her life when he met her at the well. She didn't go and do her best to get all of her junk taken care of and be completely clean before she went and persuaded the whole town. This is a both and, that God's working in your life while he's working through it. So the question that begs us this morning is simple. Are you in a position where God can work with you? Are we in a position where God can work with us? This is the question that puts feet on our faith. This is the question that has our faith larger than outside of these walls or larger than just this screen. The application. Are we in a position where God can work with us? Maybe you're here this morning or you're watching and you haven't said yes to God's grace yet. Maybe you've heard it a number of times but never thought much of it. Maybe this is your first time ever hearing something like that. And this morning, Christ is making himself very real. This morning, maybe you have to start that journey and say yes to God's work, to what he's done for you, to what he wants to do through you. Maybe you've been following Christ for a few months or 60 years. And God still wants to do a work in you. And he's still going to complete it. But you have to say yes to something. Maybe you have to say yes to something that you're fearful about, nervous about. Maybe you have to say no to something. Maybe it's a sin in your life. Just like there's loads of examples in the scriptures of people who said yes to God and he worked through their life. There are examples of people who said no. The nation of Israel as a whole, time and time again, would say no. The prophet Jeremiah in chapter 2, speaking on God's behalf, says, man, you've committed two sins. You've forsaken me, your living God, and dug for yourself your own cisterns, your own holes that can't even hold water. The nation of Israel from time to time would say no to God for lesser idols, for other stuff. Is that stopping God and the work he wants to do in your life? Your affection for a lesser idol it can be tough. Like I said, it can be painful. But God wants to do a good work in your life. And if you're here this morning and you've said yes to God's grace, and you're here this morning and you're a Christian, you're a follower of Christ, God says, listen, I began a good work in your life. I'm going to finish it. I'm going to complete it. And on the day of Christ, when Christ returns in his glory, and you are going to be complete. God is going to look at your life and say, yeah, that was good. If you would, pray with me. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I, I say this Tuesday nights at our, at our college group, I, I really do, I believe this is some of the most important time in our gathering together. Because this is, this is you and God. Just like Paul wrote in Timothy, there's one mediator, that's Jesus. And he's your mediator. You can talk to him. I want to do something this morning and, and pray it's not, not too weird for anyone, but if God spoke to you in any kind of way this morning, I just want to ask you to do something physically. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to ask you, just kind of extend your hands out. Palms up. Just palms up right in front of you. Your palms up. Extend your hands out. God's doing a work in your life. 
and the palms up. And that's going to symbolize either accepting something God has for us or letting go of something that's stopping God from working in our lives. So for some of us, that's letting go maybe of something that's holding us back, maybe a sin, whether that be bitterness, anger, whether that be a destructive habit. We're letting that go. And our palms open, it's also saying yes to what God wants to do in our lives. Maybe that's even just simply accepting his free grace and love. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never responded to the gospel, never said yes to God's grace. But what Christ has done, the work that he's done for you is so real right now and you sense him and you want to start that journey with him. Palms open. Just repeat this prayer after me and you can do it silently in your heart because God can hear your thoughts and he's the only one who needs to hear it. Say this, dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and I need you. So God, I accept the work that you've done for me on the cross. In Christ, I'm turning away from a life a life that's void, a life void of you. Christ, I'm turning to you. I want to follow you. I accept your grace. I say yes to it. Do a good work in my life. For the rest of us, Father, you want to do a good work in our lives. So help us, teach us, move us to where you're working and give us the strength and the courage, the faith to say yes, to accept the good work you want to do. Pray all these things in the powerful resurrected name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for being so kind and compassionate this morning. If you're at Lockport, Pastor Jonathan will be down in front. If God spoke to you in any kind of specific or intimate way, feel free to go down and share that with him. If you're here this morning and you're sitting here and God did a work in your life, he did an unmistakable work in your life. There's the fireside room. There's a team of pastors, other people who are going to be there. They'd love to pray with you. It takes a few short minutes. I even let you out a few short minutes early this morning. So don't just blow by, run to your car. Go talk to someone about it. A lot of times the work God wants to do in our lives is in the context of conversations we have with other people. So go to the fireside room. We'll be there. We'd love to chat with you. Again, thank you for your com compassion and your kindness. Uh, pray that you guys have an incredible week, that you experience God each and every single day. And we look forward to seeing you next week um, as we kick off uh, an exciting fall. Man, we love you guys. Thank you. Grace and peace. <laughs>